Hello and welcome to another instalment of History Hack. I'm very excited today and Meryn has come to join me because she loves all things Italian and she's very excited as well um, and because World War One's not your bag and you want to learn stuff. So who's with us Meryn? Well today we have with us Dr Vanda Wilcox who's a freelance historian living in Paris and Vanda is well published on Italian military leadership training and battlefield performance as well as the popular experience and memory of the First World War specifically in Italy. And her doctoral thesis focused on morale and discipline in the Italian army during the First World War. So that's quite a lot to unpack there, isn't it, Vanda? Just a little bit, yeah. Yeah. Welcome. This could be good. This will just not reveal that we've already been chatting for 20 minutes and been having a break. (laughs) Uh, Should we record this podcast now? Uh, Yeah, so interesting, this front, and so under-acknowledged. And you were saying that when you started researching it, everyone thought you were a weirdo um, and no one was in English at all. Uh, That has happily changed now, thanks to people like you. Um, I guess we start right at the beginning, don't we? So Italy's wider situation in 1914-15, it's a young country, uh, it's a disconnected country as well, isn't it? Yeah, I think that because it was such a recent creation, it's still in some ways finding its feet. So they've just had their 50th anniversary celebrations in 1911. And uh, it has achieved quite a bit. It's It used to be fashionable to say, oh, they're all completely disconnected and they didn't have any sense of being Italian. I don't think that's quite true, but it is still a new country. And if we compare it to somewhere like France or the UK, it's in a really different situation. And of course, We could compare it to Germany, which is also a new country, but it doesn't have the big, powerful centre that Germany has. Germany is structured around Prussia. The Italian equivalent isn't really the same. So it's a country which is still in the process of emerging onto the international scene. So so that's really interesting, because if we go back just just one step, the Italy, the Italians at this point in time, they don't actually understand what the war's about, do they? I mean, is that down to education, communication, indifference? Well, I mean, it depends who you mean by the Italians, I guess, here. Mm-hmm. Um, Italy is a country that, compared to other Western European countries, still has quite low rates of literacy. Yeah. So, especially in rural areas and especially in the South, but not only in the South, we do see some, some high rates of illiteracy. It, it varies. Up in the most wealthy northern regions, maybe only 10 to 15% of the population is illiterate, but there's parts of the South where it's about three quarters of the population. Those yeah. people are not reading the newspapers. They're not politically in, involved or engaged. And the first election at which all men could vote was only 1913. So it's, not, it's only just democratising at the point that the war breaks out. So many people aren't part of the political process. They're not reading the newspaper. There's no, not been any reason for them to be politically engaged. And so the war, especially when it first breaks out, doesn't seem like it has anything to do with them. Obviously, we have an educated middle class as well who are involved and following the news. There are newspapers there. there, You know, there's plenty of people who are acutely interested in it. Hmm. But across the country as a whole, it's quite uneven. Italy enters the war in 1915 because there are potential and they enter the war because there are potential benefits for Italy, don't they? It's not an aggressive decision based on um, wanting. It's not the same as... Uh, Austria wanting to teach Serbia a lesson or Germany wanting to take on Russia um, and regain territory. And there's nothing like that. It's just a this is happening. And what can we get from it? Isn't it? Yeah. And I think it's easy to be cynical about. um, But it's a very calculated decision. I think this is one of the really interesting comparisons. All the other countries, we study the July crisis in a lot of detail because everything happens within six weeks. Right. Everyone's making decisions in a hurry. Italy takes its time. It announces it's going to be neutral on August the 3rd, 1914, just as everyone else is going to war. It says, no, we're not getting involved. And then it can spend the whole of the autumn and winter 1914-15 basically negotiating with both sides to see who would potentially offer it what it wants. And in the end, it's the allies that are more persuasive. And what Italy most of all wants is, in the view of the nationalists, to complete unification. So there's little bits of territory that Italy believes should be Italian and that didn't get taken over from Austria back in the 19th century. So as far as they're considering it's it's kind of unfinished business. And so they enter on the side of the Allies, hoping to conquer those pieces of territory from Austria-Hungary. 
and, and that will make sense in terms of economic expansion, won't it? I mean, you, you mentioned um, industrial concentration a moment ago. That must have had important implications for recruitment, for conscription and how units were organised. Can you tell us a bit about that? Right, so the Italian situation here is uh, it's kind of messy. Um, like a lot of what's happening with the Italian war effort, it's messy. They don't organise the army in the way that we might expect to. Instead of having regional recruitment where each unit comes from a town or a village or a neighbourhood, recruitment is organised on a national level. In other words, when a man gets called up, he'll be sent to a town, probably at the opposite end of the country, and in his unit he will be serving alongside people from between 12 and 20 other military districts which could be spread all over the country so in one single unit you'll get people from naples sicily milan mountains plains you name it all jumbled in together and this was done to make in theory everybody bond the idea was that through your military service you would become more italian because you were bonding with people from all over the country does it do the opposite and just bomb morale though well, that's the obvious downside, right? The military hate this. The army say this is a stupid system. It takes forever to mobilise, as you can imagine. You've got trains going up and down the country. You've got people who live near the, war, near the war zone who, when the war breaks out, they get conscripted and they have to go down to Sicily to meet up with their unit, right? It's completely balmy. Mm. So the army hate it, but the politicians have always wanted this system because they're worried that Italy is too disjointed and too fractured and they need to kind of build more Italianness. It's During the war, they drop this because it's so hopeless. But for the first couple of years, that's how it works. It sounds like a complete recipe for disaster. I mean, from experience, I know that 20 miles apart, not so long ago, you could have different villages speaking different dialects, not understanding different cultures. And, and there was always also, um, as, as I understand, there was quite a large Italian diaspora before the First World War, wasn't there? Yeah, there's a lot. Um, it's estimated that before 1914, um, 13 million people have emigrated and there's still at least 5 million of them resident overseas when the war breaks out. And all of the men of military age who have emigrated are still liable for conscription. And the Italians do actually try to call them up. Not that many. Come, well, 300,000 come back, which That's I think amazing. is quite a lot. They're not really volunteers, they're conscripts, but they have sort of chosen to answer their papers right and they're coming back from america from argentina uh from other parts of europe there's quite a lot living in the uk actually so three hundred thousand do come back do you know how many were served papers uh nearly a million that's quite a good hit rate considering they emigrated right i think it's interesting because we kind of assume that those people would be like yeah whatever i don't care but a surprising number of them do a lot of them still have family back in italy and of course, if you were a long term draft evader, you couldn't go back to Italy afterwards. So if you want to go and see non now again, then you have to join up. And, um, and some of them have just emigrated because they're poor, but it doesn't mean they don't want to, they don't feel Italian, right? So they might still feel patriotic loyalty, even if they've gone to live in America. Yeah, that, that family instinct. I, I mean, I don't know any other country that has it like Italy. Everything's about family. Yeah, like Spain, kind of, but just not, it's still nowhere close, is it? it's it's um it's an important part of the decisions that these that these soldiers make definitely it's about so family looking at the fighting front um against austria this is wholly wholly different to the western front we're looking at mountain warfare alpine warfare tell us about the effects of that and uh, explain to people who don't do world war one why it's so hard well Let's put it this way. There's nowhere that you can do a ski tour of a First World War battlefield on the Western Front. <laughs> but there is in Italy. Um, some of the fighting, well, the front line goes to very high altitudes. It's going right through the Alps and the Dolomites. Even where it's not at sort of mountaintop height, it's in this terrible, rocky, stony terrain that when shells or bullets hit it, splinters into little shards. So you get little shards of flying rock through the air. Um, it's really horrific terrain to fight in. It's very hard to dig down and form trenches. So they do have trench warfare, just as they do on the Western Front, but it's incredibly hard to even build them. Uh, You have to kind of blow stuff up. There's a lot of explosions. Um, uh, But there's also a lot of shallow trenches that aren't very protective compared to Western Front trenches. So the terrain is is a huge obstacle. There's lots of areas where there's no clean drinking water. In the summer months, there's bits of the front where people are getting malaria and cholera. So you've got the kind of quasi like the Middle East 
uh, hot weather diseases. But then in the winter, you've got people dying from frostbite uh, and even altitude sickness, things like that. You've got can... White Friday as well, haven't you? Is it White? Is it Friday? That one day in 1916 where 10,000 are killed by avalanches. Oh, right, yeah. Avalanches is a huge killer. There's there's a couple of these big moments like that. It's estimated at least thirty to 40,000 between well, the they're two. they're doing lines. it on purpose, aren't they? They're shelling to cause avalanches. Well, that's the rumour. Yeah. It's never proven. Both sides say, oh, the other lot are deliberately causing avalanches. But obviously they never admit it to themselves. So we, we don't know whether this is just mm. a rumour. But they are tunnelling into the mountains and setting mines off kind of under the mountain peaks. The whole underground mining war is really extraordinary up in the, in the high mountains. And it's all still there. You can visit it. And there's these amazing underground tunnels still. Yeah. Meryn and I actually went climbing. Um, we just, it wasn't intended to be a climb, but we <laughs> found, uh, found some trenches. Um, and I think we climbed for about half an hour just through yeah. this trench line, which is still there because it's all hewn out of rock, so it's not going anywhere. Um, right. And we were wandering around in it. Um, and, yeah, it was an effort to get up and down. And there's these places where they're called the, what they call the Via Ferrata, which is where they literally um, embedded metal like ladders into the yeah. rock. So people could climb up and down again. They're still there. You can go climbing on them in the summer. Yeah, I did um, did that in Peru because just because I wanted the Italian front experience. There's <laughs> a hotel that's essentially two, uh, two or three pods from the London Eye glued to the side of a, a mountain, and you go you go up a Via Ferrata uh, to get to your room in inverted <laughs> commas. So we did that, but yeah, it was fantastic. But it sounds terrifying. Uh, now you have to imagine doing that in full kit. Yeah. With- boots that don't fit you carrying your rifle and all of your rations and everything else you've been given yeah which i guess is why it's so interesting for you looking at the uh like the evolution of morale in the italian army across the period and you know all these different elements the physical life at the front plus the political and social situation come together to make it um really a a very horrific experience and a very wearing experience that people even if even the more optimistic and enthusiastic soldiers at the start of the war get disheartened um quite fast i think i think for a lot of them though this issue of not really understanding what it's for not really understanding why they're fighting is a big part of the problem a lot of them are farmers they've been told that they're fighting to conquer this land they're looking around these mountains thinking well why would we even want to capture this land right what's the advantage of having this what's it for um and that doesn't change really until the last year of the war when the the army finally figures out that maybe it would be a good idea to try and have some kind of pro-war propaganda and try and persuade the men that it's really worth fighting even if it is in his spot in it is possible inhospitable even if it's tough to see why they would want to 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 move forward i mean they're, they're not connected to the political machinations of we want to recover our territory in this direction or that mm-hmm. i mean i can see the, the austrians from from the other perspective they must be looking at it saying well you know you've got an industrial center milan not far away from the front so hopefully we'll be able to to knock italy out of the war without too much trouble but but when we put that front in context with everything else that italy's dealing with i mean they're 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 fighting what Macedonia, Albania, North Africa, France. Mm-hmm. How, how are the decisions made about where they're going and why? So in the first part of the war, uh, the Italians see this as, as almost like a private war. Like, yeah, they've joined the Entente, but they just want to fight the Austrians and get their land and mind their business, right? But as the war gets bigger in other ways, as the war really globalises, the Italians start to think, uh, they get a bit of fear of missing out, right? Oh, hang on a minute. If people are going to carve up the Middle East, maybe we should be in on that. Oh, and if people are going to go to Macedonia, can we afford to sit out, yeah. right? And so they gradually get dragged into to fighting in more and more areas. They've got a major rebellion going on in, in Libya, which they'd only conquered a few years before. So they're fighting there. And the Germans and the Turks are funding the anti-Italian rebels there. So that becomes part of the war. Um, and gradually they start to get dragged in. The army doesn't really... It doesn't really like this. At least the, the main chief of the general staff for most of the war, Luigi Cadorna, he says, let's not get distracted by these sideshows. Let's concentrate on fighting the Austrians. But he gets overruled because the politicians want to prove to France and Britain that they're doing their bit and pulling their weight in the international alliance. So they send a couple of hundred thousand people to Albania and Macedonia. 
they send small detachments off to random places like Sinai and Palestine or to Manchuria, all kinds of sort of odd little groups of, of Italians going off to random places. And um, I think it's about 150,000 Italians by 1918 are serving in France as well on the Western Front. So it's all about just proving politically that Italy is really doing its bit. That's, that's really interesting because it, it highlights the difference between political objectives and the man with a rifle in his hand. They, they are for almost two different reasons. So how does, how does that translate into what happens at the front? How do, how do Italian soldiers respond to this? Well, the ones that get sent off to what we might consider slightly more random fronts, um, I mean, they're, they're, they're maybe confused, but they're not necessarily any more confused than anyone else. Do you know what I mean? They're, nobody necessarily knows why they're fighting. Uh, some of the ones that get sent to France are pretty pleased about it because the, the food in France is better and life seems a bit more comfortable. Um, when it comes to the Italians in battle, a lot of the actual tactical level is very similar to what's happening elsewhere, right? The Austrians are fighting on other fronts too. The tactics are remarkably similar to what's going on on the Western Front for a lot of the time. And uh, a lot of the problems that the Italians have about getting decent hot food up to the front lines, supplying their men with decent warm weather clothes for the winter, um, that, that really, these problems really damage Italian morale, but they're very sort of practical problems. And gradually as the war goes on, they do improve. So supplies get better, the organisation gets better, uh, Italy starts to bring in uh, food or resources from outside sometimes as well. Um, and by 1918, a lot of these things are, are starting to improve. Uh, but really, I think, uh, oh, and the other thing we haven't talked about with morale in term is chaplains. Uh, the Catholic Church really mobilises to support the war effort to a surprising degree. And I think chaplains are often quite important in helping to support um, men's morale at the front. And that was despite the church being against the war to start with, wasn't it? Because um, th this is Catholics versus Catholics, essentially. Right. So initially it's it's quite awkward. But what the Pope does is he sort of distances himself. He appoints a specific bishop who's responsible for the war effort and kind of hands it off to this other guy uh, who takes charge, and they, they then appoint chaplains to every unit, because members of the clergy are still liable for conscription. You can't make them fight, but they're still conscripted into the military, and hundreds of thousands of them serve, mostly as kind of medical corps, stretcher bearers, things like that. So you've got a, a really large number of priests that, that you need to somehow use in the army, and some of them are serving as chaplains and, and doing a lot to try and um, boost men's spirits, basically. I know we're going to, we were supposed to get to him later, but I just don't think it's possible to separate Cadorna from morale. I mean, this is a guy, uh, I mean, we joke, I joke with Nikolai all the time about the 35 battles of the Azonzo. This is a guy that repeatedly, to these men, he is a man that repeatedly sends them into the same battle with the same issues and they suffer tens of thousands of casualties over and over again. What impact do you think Cadorna directly has on morale? I mean, he's quite an unlovable character, let's put it that way. I don't quite dislike him as much as I dislike Conrad, but he's up there. He's, um, yeah, I think in my new book I've called him a pig-headed reactionary. He's yeah. not a nice guy. <laughs> um, let's, okay, so to be fair, what are his good qualities? He's hardworking, he's not stupid, um, he's certainly determined, um, we perhaps too determined but he's he's he doesn't give up easily right he's so much a man of his time he was sent away to military boarding school when he was nine or ten years old his father was the general that had captured rome his grandfather was also a general he had no options in life other than to become a, an officer and that's what he did uh he has been raised he's from this very very devout very aristocratic family his sisters and daughters mostly become nuns um, he's been raised to know that he is going to be in charge and command men and that he has been basically put by God on earth to do that. And he has no problems with self-doubt. Um, nice way of putting it, yeah. Yeah. So the problem really is that he should never have become chief of general staff. The chief of general staff before him dies in July 1914. It's the worst timing, right? Just as there's the big crisis of the war beginning, the chief of general staff drops dead. 
and they have to appoint Cardona and they don't want to appoint him. They've already passed him over for the top job once before because they know he's not the right man for the job. But in a crisis with a war looming, they can't afford to spend months carefully thinking about who do we want to shoot. They just have to pick the most senior general and that's Cardona. So in a sense, there's this sort of terrible bad luck element. He's never held operational command. He's only ever been a pen pusher. Um, he's never been on the field of battle. Um, he's not stupid. During the period of the first nine months, right, when Italy's not fighting, that he's getting reports coming in from the Western Front and he's reading them and he is studying them, mostly from the French army. For various reasons, he's not very interested in the British army. He's more interested in the French as a model because the Italians are also a mass conscript army like the French. He thinks that that's a better comparison, whereas the British army is professionals. He doesn't think that's going to be a very helpful example to learn from in 1914, 1915. So he's studying the reports that come in of French tactics and he's trying to, to the best of his vision, adapt what the French are doing to fighting in a mountain, rocky context. So even, even if he is not ideal for the job, he's not daft. And what he's doing is he is nurturing the evolution of an army, isn't it? Right. I mean, the, the thing that he probably does best is he transforms the army that Italy has in the summer of 1914. In the summer of 1914, Italy couldn't have gone to war. The army is in pieces. They've only just finished conquering Libya and they're in a mess. They have a massive shortage of officers, a massive shortage of NCOs, massive shortage of equipment, rifles, artillery, you name it. By May 1915, they're pretty much ready to fight. And I would say that's his best achievement. He actually does organize them, recruit the men, get the training done, get the resources in place. And, you know, what he doesn't have is ideas. So he takes, he studies what the French are doing, and he amends his orders and the tactics that they use at least in theory do change there's quite an interesting study of someone who's gone through my sort of micro level and looked at the different instructions that he's putting out through the two and a half years of war and they do change but then he doesn't do anything to make sure that anyone follows those instructions so mm. the men on the ground are just doing the same thing as they've always done and he sends out some new orders saying oh well the French are doing this maybe we should try that no one's even I don't know if they're even reading them they're just going okay right whatever and still doing the same thing. And he makes zero effort to see whether his orders are actually changing anything on the ground. This is good. Oh, we're getting really deep now. When um, Diaz takes over, he lets the generals get on with it and the difference is marked. So <laughs> that, just like, Cordona isn't monitoring them to make sure they follow the orders, but yet the other guy gives them more freedom yeah. and they get their shit done. So right. is it that he's too much of a micromanager when it comes to actually fighting? So, yeah, it's, it's a bit of a paradox. He won't delegate any responsibility. Yeah. Everything has to be in his control. But he also sacks people as soon as they blink. He sacks, I'm trying to remember the numbers, it's something like 217 generals or senior senior ranked officers just in two and a half years and um uh, and hundreds more kind of mid-rank officers so if anything goes wrong when you're in charge Cardona just sacks you he doesn't stop to find out why it went wrong or what happened or if you were just following his instructions just sacks you so they're terrified to do anything they're too scared of him right mm -hmm. um so they just sort of keep doing what they think they ought to be doing without even paying any real attention to the orders they're getting and he never checks up there's not like a system of feedback because he's not interested in what anyone else has to say so he's not getting feedback from his officers on the ground saying oh did this work how can we make this change this tweak this work together because it's this completely top-down authoritarian model so he's hopeless um but it's not because he's stupid it's because he's so inflexible mm. I've, I've got a theory as well you, you tell me if i'm wrong on this so we're looking at Cadorna's view from the top down. But what he's got a handle from the bottom up, surely, is, is an army, a conscripted army, that's got to be mostly villagers and peasants. And they've come from a background of client-patron relationships where we're almost a feudal system. And they're, they're walking into a war with expectations about what their duties are going to be. So they're not used to discipline at all. And, and having to follow orders. Well, I'd be a bit careful about that because this is a country that has peacetime military service. So all men have done, well, all fit men have done two years of, or in some cases, three years of military service when aged 18, 19. 
So they have got prior, a lot of them have got prior military experience. But the discipline that they have in the Italian army, is what's that, how does that compare with other armies? Well, I mean, the, you're right about the kind of social dynamic that what we basically have is a kind of aristocratic officer corps. Yeah. Um, and the view that they have towards the mass of the soldiers is that they're all ignorant peasants, whether or not that's true. Um, and Cadorna's view is it's not actually a good idea to persuade them or inform them because that's dangerous and that could lead to socialism and, you know, the masses having ideas. We don't want that. Instead, we, should, we want blind obedience. So he wants a kind of feudal relationship. The real problem for him is that that's, he doesn't get it. The men don't want to see things that way. Some of them are already socialists. Some of them are industrial workers from the cities, whatever. But he wants to impose that kind of feudal um, authoritarian approach so he has a very very rigid disciplinary system it's really interesting i think even just in a symbolic way his very first order on the day that the war begins so 24th of may 1915 order number one he talks only about discipline wow and it's through he says through iron discipline that will win this war that's literally the very first thing that he sends out and that's how he views it so if something goes wrong it's because the men haven't been sufficiently disciplined and the officers haven't been sufficiently strict one of the things he sacks senior officers for is failing to be sufficiently harsh towards their men and wow. this this comes to a head effectively with the disaster of caporetto doesn't it because right. this reaction is is just unforgivable really so just for listeners who don't know how bad i mean italians still say oh it all went caporetto to describe right. something that is an absolute disaster so just briefly tell people what happened and how cadorna then reacted so the disaster of caporetto is um it's a battle that begins in uh, October 1917 austria borrows some divisions from germany and they launch a joint attack through the mountains. Uh, it's a pretty well planned attack. They attack at dawn through the fog. They use gas and they use particularly uh, innovative new infiltration tactics that the Germans and the German stormtroopers in particular have been developing in 1917. And they attack at a time, it's the end of October, the Italians are beginning to think that things are all over for the winter and they attack in a sector where the troops have been sent basically for a quiet life. There's no reserves available. The munitions stores are a long way away. And it's a complete fiasco. Just within the first 48 hours, the Central Powers attack has basically completely wiped out all of the key defensive positions of the line. Within three weeks, the Italians have retreated 150 kilometers. They've had nearly 300,000 prisoners taken and about the same number, nearly 300,000, have basically just chucked their rifle on the ground and walked off home. They've kind of disappeared. Uh, discipline has broken down. Uh, officers have abandoned their posts. Uh, it's complete chaos. Uh, there's also about uh, between 10 and 15,000 casualties as well. And the, the, the results are devastating. More than 1 million Italian civilians end up living under enemy occupation. We have um, hundreds of thousands of refugees fleeing from the area. It's a, it's a really humiliating disaster. Cadorna decides that this is the fault of the soldiers. And straight away, he makes a public announcement. This is the really fatal bit. He doesn't just say this in private. It gets published in the newspapers. He says, our soldiers cowardly abandoning their posts. He blames the men for running away. And the government is horrified. They try to withdraw this, but it's too late. It's already gone out in the press. Everyone's already seen it. Uh, it goes international. The Italian ambassador has this very embarrassing experience where the king in London calls him in and says, oh, I hear that your soldiers have all run away. And it's this you know, deeply humiliating moment. And um, it infuriates everybody. And it basically seals Cadorna's fate. You know, people were already beginning to question his ability as a general. But this moment where he blames the soldiers and he basically says that they're all cowards and deserters is horrific. Uh, and he blames especially the ones who have been taken prisoner. He says they've deliberately surrendered to undermine Italy because they're defeatists or uh, he blames them. He says they're Bolsheviks. It's happening around the same time as the Bolshevik Revolution as well. So it's very interesting timing, right? Um, yeah, because every other country, I mean, regardless, even in Britain, um, they're, they're shitting themselves. That this might be catching. Every country in Europe thinks this might be catching. And, and Italy 
And it has a very strong left-wing movement. In June 1914, there was a kind of quasi-revolution, right? They call it Red Week, uh, where half the country seems to be up in arms and flying red flags off of their local town halls and stuff. So, of course, they're shitting themselves. Yeah, well. everyone is. Um, so then uh, Diaz takes over. Yeah. And then Italy... So Caporetto is reversed in the end. Um, and I guess we haven't put this in the questions, but tell everybody, because I think people need to understand before we talk about post-war experiences... Um, that so this happens Cadorna goes which must have been good for the morale of the men Diaz <laughs> looser with his command um and it works and then we have Vittorio Veneto yeah so Diaz comes in and uh he is a fighting officer right he's made his way up through field command it makes a big difference um so there's some things where he really loosens up he's no longer as uh as harsh he's still has the same disciplinary structure but he applies it in a more humane way so for example it used to be that if you got back home from back from leave 12 hours late you would, could be accused of desertion and Diaz says you know your train might have been delayed this is ridiculous right so he's a bit not soft but he's a, sort of eases up a bit on that Pays you a lot can more tell attention. he's been in contact with men that's how right. I read him with yeah. Cadorna is in this ivory tower and doesn't have a clue he's on another planet right. Whereas Diaz has had face-to-face contact with the men right. he commanded. He's got a more, in a way, a more realistic perspective of the men he has to command. And he knows that things on the ground matter. So he pays, he gets a pay rise. He gets better separation allowances. A lot of the men in the front have been frantic because their families are starving without them. They haven't got enough, pay, you know, separation allowances. Uh, pensions, insurance, all of the sort of treatment of a soldier in practical terms, he massively improves. And that definitely helps. But also kind of, Propaganda, I know it sounds like a, a, we, we consider it as a negative, but just to, in terms of telling the soldiers what they're fighting for, you know, yeah. why are we here? What is yeah. the point of the war? That's and actually, like, propaganda means something completely different at this time. We've a fantastic yeah. article on this in the Great War Group magazine this time round from Christopher Alexander. It, it, the negative connotations aren't there yet. Propaganda also means informing your own side. Right. No and it's so that. important. Um, the other thing that helps paradoxically after Caporetto is that the, the dynamic has changed. Before you were trying to conquer somebody else's land, but now you're trying to liberate your own land. Now there are Italian women and children and old people living under enemy occupation and being mistreated by them, as far as I should say. And now you're fighting to liberate them and to recover those lost lands. So that really changes the dynamic and that, that helps motivate people in a different way in that final year. And they rout the, rout the Austro-Hungarians at the end, don't they? Right. So the Austro-Hungarians make one last big attack on the Piave in June 1918. And after that, basically, they've got too many problems at home. And Italy does an, a, a final offensive one year to the day after the Battle of Caporetto has started uh, with French and British support. And they have a, a huge success at Vittorio Veneto. It's quite interesting because actually, of all of the the powers fighting at the very end of the war it's Italy that has a big offensive success like the the armistice on the western front doesn't come off the back of a specific allied battle it's more about like Mm -hmm. German exhaustion but Italy actually has this really successful moment right at the very end of the war Um, and the Italians think this is great news right that we've won a, a really concrete victory so they end the war on this real high note of optimism that that things are going to really get better now they do and so that's obviously the morale of that so Italy is victorious they don't get everything that they wanted when they entered the war which was like the Croatian coastline all the way down to Dubrovnik nearly wasn't it uh, it was cheeky they don't get it all but they are victorious but... I went on honeymoon in that bit of Dalmatia that Italy wanted and I thought well I can see why they wanted it it's a really nice area yeah, <laughs> yeah exactly um, but I'm not sure that's a good basis for making your foreign policy <laughs> No, so how is um how does Italy see the end of the war then and and tell us about post war experiences of the veterans and disabilities and things like that? How do they make out compared to others? So I mean, this is potentially a huge topic because, as you probably know, what we have looming in the not very far background is fascism right it's not very far until we have the fascist takeover, which is a whole other topic but um the Italians end the war on this this moment of optimism and excitement and a sense of achievement, and then they see it somehow all go wrong. It's like they've won the war and they lose the peace. That's the classic line. Mm. And in particular, 
they're really bitter at their allies. They think that throughout the war, the French and British haven't really taken them seriously, haven't really given them the credit that they deserve. And by the way, they still think this today. If you talk to a lot of Italians today, they're quite resentful of this, some of them. They'll say, oh, you know, the British and French go on about the Western Front, but they don't know what we fought and what we suffered in the mountains. There's this long-term sense that, uh, that outside of Italy, people haven't really appreciated the Italian sacrifices and the Italian effort. And, you know, they, they've had 600,000 war dead, and the proportion uh, compared to pre-war population is basically exactly the same as in the UK. Mm. Right. So, yeah, I mean, like, there are. So I, I road trip Sicily, and every town has a war memorial, just like town and village has a war memorial here. Absolutely, it's it's every bit as devastating socially and in human terms as in the UK. But they feel that they haven't had that appreciated. And I so think they, perhaps people, uh, Asquith didn't help with his perfidious Italy comments at the no. beginning, did he? So they were seen as coming in for the wrong reasons, but right. they still did come in, and like you say, six hundred thousand war dead. And, um, yeah, it, I think you can see why they're resentful. You can also see why the British and French get annoyed with them, especially at the Paris Peace Conference, you know? I've just finished writing a book about um, the imperial and colonial sides of the Italian war effort, and so I've spent a lot of time looking at the peace conference and the post-war settlement. And really, you know, I, I don't want to feel this, but the Italians are really annoying, and they, they are out for what they can get. Yeah. And they are kind of grasping Everyone's out for what they can get. It's just yeah. that, you know, the, the countries that, that are most... I happy. think the other countries, their kind of perception is we were dragged into this war. You right. came into it because you wanted stuff. So really you're exactly. like uh, below us in the pecking order. Exactly. And it's much easier to critique the weaker countries who are out for what they can get than the more powerful ones. France and Britain and the USA are also out for what they can get, but they are powerful enough that they can kind of get away with it. Whereas the Italians aren't right and they end up looking a bit ridiculous um and so again that all feeds into this resentment so what are we going to do with all of these demobilized veterans we have hundreds of thousands of them with severe disabilities uh whether it's blindness or loss of limbs uh there's a huge problem with unemployment exactly as in other countries there's also a snorter of an economic crisis right the italian tax base is right down their balance of trade is gone and they're very very heavily in debt they've borrowed mostly from the uk but also from the us um those debts are now due and the, the economic mess makes it much worse how on earth can they possibly take care of their veterans properly when they're in such an economic mess they kind of can't so what we see quite early on is that the veterans organizations at least some of them become quite politically active and some veterans get quite uh, resentful and angry about the settlement and so they become um, a sort of potential reservoir if you like of recruits to political extremism and we see already from 1919, less than 12 months after the end of the war, we're getting the, the kind of proto-fascists uh, and proto-fascist violence, a lot of which is coming out of veterans. Um, so the, the situation goes downhill really, really fast, um, which I think is quite interesting. It's, it's absolutely fascinating. And, and that sets up the, the sequence of events that then moves Italy as, as a fracture state towards the Second World War eventually and, and everything right. that's happened there. Found that it, it's been absolutely brilliant because I've learned so much about how the structure, the top down structure with Cadorna and the bottom up influence of morale among men had such an impact on the way they fought and what they achieved during the, during the First World War. I know you mentioned briefly that you've got a book coming out, haven't you? In have. and that's, that's the Italian Empire and the Great War. Would you come back and talk to us about that? With enormous pleasure. It comes out in August, so I would be very excited to come and talk about it. I've, I've, yeah, I've, I've seen a, um, <laughs> a glimpse of the front cover and I can't wait to talk about that. Okay, wonderful. Great. And are you, you said you're already working on another book. Um, I'm working on some little projects. I'm not, I haven't started the next book yet. I'm, okay, yeah, you're having the break. In the <laughs> Brilliant. Thank you so much. Brilliant. Thank you. This is really fun. Don't forget that we do exist on Patreon as History Hack and on Patreon as well, which is Podbean's own version. Uh, Elena and I have had massive fun doing this in 2020, uh, but life's going to change quite a lot next year and we're going to actually have to go and earn a living, etc. If we want to keep up the regularity that we've been bringing you and the kind of guests that we've been bringing you and the workload, then we will need your help. So uh, if you join 
There's going to be incentives for joining on either of those platforms. We're revamping ourselves on both of them. So don't forget to go in. You can do as little as a dollar a month and it all goes towards keeping up History Hack as regular as we've been able to bring it to you this year. When our guests join us to talk about their work and their new book, the 45 minutes or so they spend with us is just a taster of all their efforts. So to this end, we have launched our very own bookshop on bookshop.org, where you can find our guests' latest and greatest books. You can support them and you can support History Hack too. 10% of every sale via our bookshop supports the podcast and allows us to keep at it and bring you more amazing guests. You can find our bookshop at bookshop.org forward slash shop forward slash hack history or just search on bookshop.org for us under the shops bit. Thank you for your continued support and here's to your next great 